Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Firm Returns podcast with me, James Goodwin. So this week I'm going to be going over a uh, new write-up I've done. So this is brand new, not going over an older one. Uh, This is one I just published on the 6th of March, so uh, just came out yesterday, in fact. Um, And it's on Fuller, Smith & Turner, or FSTA. So let's start with a business overview. So Fuller, Smith & Turner, Fuller's, is a hospitality business listed on the London Stock Exchange with a market capitalization of circa £312 million. The company owns and operates a portfolio of pubs and hotels located in the south of England, which are divided into managed inns, directly operated by Fuller's, and tenanted inns, leased out to entrepreneur managers. The company also used to own a brewery and wholesale drinks business, but sold this to Asahi in 2019 for total proceeds of £250 million. The intent of that divestment was to focus the company's resources on the core pubs and hotels business that generated 87% of operating profits in financial year 2019. As part of the sale, they signed a long-term supply agreement, which uh, I've abbreviated to LTSA, extending out to 2029, wherein SIE will continue to supply beer and other drinks to Fuller's pubs price rises capped at CPI. As of 26th of March 2022, the property estate totaled 385 properties, 211 managed and 174 tenanted. The managed properties can be further divided into 76 urban, 96 suburban and 39 rural, including 8 pubs from the acquisition of Bell and the Dragon in June 2018 and seven hotels from the acquisition of Cotswold Inns and Hotels in October 2019. The company's diverse estate includes locations ranging from the City of London to, which is the square mile, the financial hub of London for anyone who's not familiar with it, to airport terminals, in this case Heathrow, and picturesque villages. This allows them to cater to a mix of customer groups, but in general they are targeting the more affluent. In this regard, they benefit from 21% higher hospitality spend in their regions versus the UK average, and 19% higher incomes. So this is uh, a sort of key point here actually, and I think it's discussed later on, is this focus on the premium segment makes them quite uh, recession resistant and you see you'll see from the revenues and other data later on when we look at it that you can bet you can't even tell that there was a recession really from looking at their their profits and revenue numbers in uh, 2008 2009 it just looks like a smooth upward curve pretty much un- unbroken so yeah um Let's have a look. The pubs are operated locally and treated as independent cash generating units, CGUs, with general managers given a free reign over decor, food and drink menus and entertainment, allowing them to tailor their offering to local clientele. This can be seen in city pubs offering a range of cocktails to younger to younger customers coming in after work, or rural pubs providing a selection of fine wines and accompanying dishes to more mature patrons. In this respect, they are able to flexibly compete with their independent peers. However, being part of a larger company with central facilities does confer some decided advantages. First amongst these is centralised purchasing, which allows each pub to reliably secure the food, drink and other supplies they need at the discounts afforded by buying in bulk. This was ever more important during the supply chain disruption that occurred during the pandemic. The individual pubs also benefit from a centralised IT and booking system that includes targeted digital marketing using data acquired from across the group. The company recently completed a digital transformation project which has significantly increased its digital capabilities. This includes a new mailing system that allows them to contact customers on a regular basis and track response rates and associated spend. 
The data fed back from these email campaigns was has helped to identify the offers and events that most interest their customers and has also better defined the target audiences for digital advertising. Another aspect of the digital transformation project was the implementation of a new hotel booking engine that integrates directly with meta search platforms such as Google, Trivago and TripAdvisor. This has made it easy for customers to book directly with Fuller's rather than going through online travel agents like Booking.com for instance. Avoiding commission payments and building digital relationships with customers. They have also built in the opportunity for auxiliary sales such as allowing customers to book a table for dinner at the same time as booking a room. Future developments in their pipeline include adding a loyalty scheme to further increase the incentives to book direct and generate and help generate recurring revenue. The company offers its employees meaningful career paths that help it to attract and retain talent. This is illustrated by the fact that 60% of general managers join the company in entry level roles. I think this equates to 123 general managers again from entry level roles. Every year they take on over 100 apprentice chefs who are trained in the company's chef's guild with a clear career pathway right up to executive chef level. Which I presume an executive chef is the top chef in, a, in an individual pub or hotel. In an inspired collaboration, Fuller's has sponsored the UK national team in the international Bocuse d'Or. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Anyone who speaks French? Cooking competition. This has given them access to top Michelin star chefs, including Simon Rogan and Ashley Palmer Watts, who, by the way, have something like one has two Michelin stars, this one has three, it's pretty ridiculous. Who have designed an exclusive range of dishes branded only at Fuller's, available at select Fuller's pubs and taught at the Chef's Guild. The ability to attract and internally develop talent creates a steady flow of new general managers to run the expanding estate. This allows the company to scale without lowering its quality as internally trained managers already have an understanding of operations from being a part of them. The tenanted inns are a highly profitable part of the business that operates under a franchise type model whereby the company receives income from rent payments that scale with pub revenues and from sales of food slash drink to the tenants on a wholesale basis. So much like you'd have um, perhaps with a McDonald's or something like that, um, because I believe McDonald's also owns the reholds of the franchises, the franchise restaurants, uh, but perhaps a little different to something like uh, I think a, a lot of other franchises like Subway and things like that. Uh, it's up to the tenant to actually lease them out independently and find the venue and Subway just takes the franchise fee for the, the branding and providing all of the uh, the equipment and well they sell you all the equipment and stuff but provide the uh, the food to you the, the on a wholesale basis so lease agreements usually span three to five years and include annual price increases in line with inflation Pubs can also move from managed to tenanted and vice versa depending on what is deemed to be the most profitable use of the property at a given time. In response to the inflationary pressures on utilities expenses, Fuller's has been trialling a project allowing tenants to purchase their utilities through Fuller's in much the same way that they buy their inventory, thereby benefiting from the buying power and hedging capabilities of the wider group. When signing on new tenants, the company ensures that they have very low levels of debt relative to capital they are investing into the enterprise. This substantially limits the risk of insolvencies across the tenanted estate. So yeah, I mean, the centralised, the fact that they can centralise the, the buying and of all their stuff, and I mean, even extending out to utilities and stuff like that is a major draw for... I mean, it's the same with with all franchises, isn't it? That if you've got access to a premium range of, in this case, beers and wines, branded that people are going to be drawn to a brand that they're drawn to, um, and in this case, the premises being provided as well, uh, it, it's an attractive thing over the 
daunting task of trying to start your own pub from scratch with not having maybe any links to suppliers and the industries so you've got to get sold out all of that kind of stuff and you're not got any kind of contracts it's difficult to get if you're a small buying position it's difficult for you to prevent the uh wholesalers increasing prices to you and all this stuff so on for the um for the drinks they're providing and the food and all that kind of stuff and in this case utilities as well a lot of pubs are being put out of business by utilities expenses going up the fact that fuller's is able to hedge all of this stuff and centrally buy it it means that uh, their their tenants are benefiting as well as well as their their managed estate so yeah lots of uh, benefits there so uh, now I'm going to move on to have a look at the ownership structure so the company's share structure is complicated by the fact that it is still largely family controlled and the family members having with the family members having their own share class or two share classes in this case. In total, there are three share classes, A, B, and C. The A shares are publicly listed, hence F STA, while the B and C shares held by the family members and company executives are unlisted and have certain restrictions. The A and C shares both have a nominal value of 40 pence and the B shares have a nominal value of 4 pence. This reflects the fact that in most matters B shares carry one tenth of the value of A and C shares, with the exception being voting rights where all share classes are equal. And this is crucial because there's actually quite a bit more, uh, quite a, a few more B shares outstanding than the other share classes because they carry one tenth of the value. Um, you'll see the actual proportionate voting rights and uh, sort of profit entitlements are quite quite different so we'll just have a look at those now so using the share counts from the financial year 2022 annual report so last year's annual report um, the for the period ending I think 26th of March last year um, the proportionate voting rights were 28.6% 62% and 9.4% for the A, B and C share classes respectively so yeah you can see that the B shares and C shares together have a substantial majority but even on their own just the B shares have a majority uh, vote which gives the family control and then uh, in contrast the profit entitlements were 64.7% 14% and 21.2% respectively so you can see that the uh, publicly listed shares are entitled to 64.7% of the profits but only 28.6% of the vote and then the main the sort of dominant family owned shares are the B shares which have 62% uh, of the voting rights but only 14% of the profit entitlements so yeah it's uh, that's how the control is maintained but there's still the publicly listed shares still actually get uh, erode most of the profits and dividend distributions and what have you So as mentioned above, the unlisted B and C shares have certain ownership and conversion restrictions. Holders of the C shares have the opportunity to convert them to A shares, which can then be sold on the stock exchange twice yearly, provided at least 30 days notice is given prior to the release of the full year and half year results. The B shares cannot be converted to any other share class and have transfer restrictions ensuring they are kept within the holder's family. Management are also issued B shares as part of their share based compensation, which is interesting. So, there are uh, some of the share based compensation for the executives, like the CEO, um, CFO, although well, I think they're called just financial director and uh, retail director, uh, are all well, not, not all, but a portion of them are in the B shares, which they can't sell. So, it's um, yeah, they're kind of locked into a certain amount of ownership in the company. So the fact that a controlling ownership share is unlisted protects the company from take hostile takeovers, something that can be a real threat when the stock is trading cheaply. However, since public shareholders have little say over the election of management, they have to place their trust in con the controlling families to select directors that will give the business, sorry, that will manage the business in their best interests. 
In this regard, family ownership can be a double-edged sword, but in the case of Fuller's, I think it's a net benefit. A little bonus that's worth mentioning is that holders of at least 1,000 A shares are eligible to receive a shareholder indulgence card, entitling them to discounts at managed pubs and hotels. So <laughs> I actually bought it after writing this and deciding that I wanted to, to buy the stock, I actually bought exactly 1,000 A shares just so I could get the <laughs> get the card. That was a, roughly what I was looking to invest anyway, just from the, the share price, but uh, yeah, it was um, quite a funny coincidence. So I'll be uh, using that next time I'm down in London for something to get the 15% discount, I believe it is. In their pubs, well, given the cost of uh, <laughs> London beer and uh, the general alcohol and food prices, I think that 15% discount will just take a little bit of the sting out. So um, now we're going to move on to have a look at the the balance sheet. So as of the 24th of September 2022, the company had non current assets totaling 714.9 million pounds of which the largest components were 591.8 million pounds of property plant and equipment which is mainly their estate of uh, pubs and hotels and 69.2 million pounds for right of use assets which will be their leased um, properties so there's some eight uh, percent of the well we're going to get on to that second, but yeah, eight percent of the ninety-two percent of the portfolio, property portfolio is held under freeholds, and eight percent is held under leaseholds or leases. So, twenty-two million pounds for retirement benefit obligations. So this is the uh, surplus in their corporate pension scheme, which I think is something like the total liabilities are one hundred and twenty million, something like that. It's like a twenty-two million above that that they've got in terms of the asset values because of the there's been a bit of a boon because of the movement in interest rates that has um, increased the discount rate and brought down their liabilities further than the assets they also had some kind of hedging in place for that um, and then finally 29.3 million pounds for intangible assets so as I said the right of use assets relate primarily to the 8% of the property estate held under leases rather than freeholds and the majority of the £29.3 million of intangible assets relates to goodwill associated with the acquisition of the Gales estate back in 2005. I think it was something like £21.5 million of goodwill they've got recognised on that, on the balance sheet for that estate. And the Gales estate was, an, was another uh, brewery that they uh, another I can't remember the, I think a Midlands somewhere in the Midlands um, brewery that they they purchased and got the estate of pubs with it as well. So the value of the property estate recognised on the balance sheet is based on a valuation dating back to 1999. So 23-24 years ago. In financial year 2022, management conducted a revaluation that produced a significantly higher figure of £995.6 million. Pounds. So yeah, just remember when you're looking at this that just think about most of their estate, not most, but well, most all of their estate is in the south, in and around London, the south of England, and a lot of it is in really premium areas like in the city of London. And there is, think about where the big, um, financial corporations have got their skyscraper and so on this is the kind of locations we're talking about and and to think that 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 is just think generally about how much london property prices have gone up it's just uh crazy to think that they haven't that they haven't moved since 1999 in probably the most premium segment of the of the uk property market uh, so this figure was calculated by applying an appropriate multiple to the earnings of each property and a and an external chartered surveyor was employed to provide independent valuations of 20% of the managed estate. An average multiple of 11.8 times 
was applied to manage freehold assets, 3.3 times to manage leasehold assets, and 10.9 times to manage, uh, sorry, to tenanted assets. So yeah, this, those are the earnings multiples basically of, um, I think it would have been EBITDA, because that's sort of like your operating earnings effectively. Um, what the actual operations of the of the venues is going to provide, and that's generally the way that they're they're valued on the market as a multiple of that. So quite a conservative way to do it, I think. Doing it, calculating it based on that rather than just doing any kind of, in fact, again, any kind of perhaps frenzied prices that would be available. It's done on a more conservative fundamentals basis which I like makes it more plausible to me so set against these non-current assets is 239.2 million pounds in non-current liabilities comprising 149.6 million pounds in borrowings 71.6 million pounds in lease liabilities 16.4 million pounds in deferred tax liabilities and 1.6 million pounds in retirement benefit obligations the borrowings represent the amount drawn from the company's £200 million credit facility, which is split between a £110 million revolving credit facility and a £90 million term loan. The interest rate margin on borrowings from this credit facility is dependent on the leverage covenants, net debt to EBITDA and interest cover ratios, plus SONIA, Sterling Overnight Index Average. Due to the enforced closures during the pandemic, the company had to take out significant loans to keep the business afloat while it was unable to trade. This included the issuance of £100 million of commercial paper to the Bank of England under the COVID Corporate Financing Facility, CCFF, alongside private sources of credit. In April 2021, the company completed an equity placing which raised £51.8 million, subsequently used to repay some of this debt. The remaining borrowings were then rolled into the new £200 million credit facility which extends out to May 2026. It's also worth noting that during the pandemic the loan covenants were broken but subsequently waived and replaced with a minimum liquidity requirement of £10 million tested each month. The covenants have since gone back to EBIT the multiples and interest cover requirements after the refinancing that took place in May 2022. Management has stated that their target leverage ratio, which is again is net debt to EBITDA, is 3x, and they plan to use their credit facility to finance continued acquisitions. While CapEx on the existing estate is funded by cash flows from operations, debt is being used as the structural component of the business to fund inorganic growth. The company's large portfolio of freehold property assets makes it relatively easy for them to secure the required financing to sustain this model, but there is an element of risk as they will need to periodically refinance their debt as it becomes due. Moving the current portion of assets, sorry, moving to the current portion of assets, the total came to £42.7 million divided between £20.4 million of cash and short-term deposits. £17.9 million of trade and other receivables, £4.3 million of inventories, and £0.1 million of current tax receivable. Set against this was total current liabilities of £69.6 million, comprising £63.1 million of trade and other payables, £6 million of lease liabilities, and £0.5 million of provisions. It's apparent from these figures that the current ratio of 0.6 one is significantly below one. Looking back at the historical data, this seems to be how the company has been run, with periods where this ratio is exaggerated by debt becoming due. This current ratio is similar to that seen for supermarkets and other businesses with a high turnover of perishable inventory. See charts below. So I've got a chart here of showing the current ratio from 2002 to 2022 for Fuller's and then the same for same period for Sainsbury's and you can see other than a few periodic 
drops where they have to refinance their uh, debt. So, so let's say it's got about every kind of every four years, basically they have to refinance their debt, and then that means that suddenly their current liabilities spike up, which reduces their current ratio down. And that happens. Yes, yeah, so you see these period of drops, but then the rest of the time they're kind of operating around the six to seven. 0 0.6 to 7, well, kind of yeah, averaging around that mark. It's very, it's a very similar picture for Sainsbury's, though, with um, a little less, a little few of the of the drops. Um, presumably, they've got a slightly different. Uh, they've maybe got different maturities on their debt, so they're a bit more staggered. So they've got ones maturing every year rather than having them maturing every four years, as this is happening with others. Um, and that actually is an interesting point I've not really thought of before. Um, maybe, maybe that's something Fuller's would benefit from, rather than. I mean, it is a much smaller company than Sainsbury's, of course, but having a, some kind of staggering with its debts, so the maturities weren't all. So it's sort of you know credit facilities weren't having to be renewed periodically. But I mean, the advantage of of Fuller's having such a massive freehold estate. Um, is that they've got you know their debt to equity is is very favourable for raising finance. I mean, and they can get it. I'm sure at much lower rates than um, if they're op uh, other pub chains or whatever that operate purely on like a leasing model rather than having free owning the freeholds um, would be getting. And I mean, I'm sure it's the same story for like the supermarkets and stuff where they're I know a lot of them own the freeholds. I mean, that was one of the big attractions of Morrison's when that recently got bought out by um, private equity firms. The idea being that they could take that lead, take that the freeholds, and uh, because it's a fairly stable business in terms of the, unless you have you know pandemic lockdowns and stuff but that didn't really affect the supermarkets that much anyway but in the, it did obviously affect hospitality venues like Fuller's but if, as you'll see later on very stable sort of um, revenues and operating income levels you get a business like that you could buy it and then it would be able to service quite high levels of debt so that you could do something like it wouldn't be great for those long term durability of the business but it's a way to get a quick return which is what the private equities wanted to do which you'd buy a business for all the freehold assets it has and then um, sell all of those assets and lease them back and that's um, that's a common thing I believe that's what's happening now with Morrison's and possibly with Asda as well it's another one that was bought out in 2021 or I think um, but yeah so but the nice thing about having the the family control is that there's a, and with the restriction on the B shares as well and and when you look at the actual ownership distribution it's spread quite widely amongst the family so it's not like there's a couple of family members that own all of it or anything it's been going for generations and generations through the family so you've got you know every all the cousins and what have you have all got shares so there are uh, probably something like 20 or 30 people who have got shares large enough to be included in the annual report um, meaning they're up above a couple, 2 or 3% or whatever it, it requires to, to be publicly displayed um, but yeah having that ownership structure and the restrictions on it and so on um, means that it would be quite difficult they'd have to be the, get the consensus of the whole family to basically put the or a majority of the the family and then the public shares and so on and it just means that anything any kind of hostile takeover is completely off the cards it would have to be very much a, a, a group decision uh, and, and if you couldn't get the consensus of the whole family you'd have to get maybe the, all the public shareholders as well involved so pretty unlikely that they could come in and do something like that like they've done with you know, the we've seen with Morrison's and other supermarkets and stuff um so yeah, let's have a look so Subtracting the total liabilities from the total assets gives us a total equity figure 
of £457.1 million, equating to a net asset value, NAV, per share of £7.41. So just for comparison, I think the shares are currently trading at about £5.36 or something. Um, that's what you can buy them for, and there's something like £5.15 to, to sell them or something. Um, so yeah, it's still significant sort of margin there. But then if we use the more recent um, estate valuation instead, the NAV per share figure becomes £13.80. So more than double the current share price. So a lot of upside. And we'll get on to valuation later on. So I won't discuss that too much here. So um, yeah, let's move on to the income. So the annual revenue figures for the last 20 years show a steady upward trend leading to the up to the sale of the brewery business in 2018-19, which reset the baseline to around £300 million. And then the dramatic drop in 2020-2021 to due to the pandemic lockdowns. Something notable here is that the recession in 2008 had no noticeable impact on their sales, which speaks to the benefits of operating the premium segment of the market. Yeah, so you can't really see any any sign that there was a recession from the revenue figures. As can be seen from the chart below, the managed pubs and hotels business drove most of the revenue growth seen in 2009 onwards. So uh, this is a, a segmental split of revenue. So you can see the managed is split up into the the managed pubs and hotels, so the managed inns, the tenanted inns, and the uh, the beer the beer business, the brewery, up until it it was sold. Uh, the, so you just got it up until the end of financial year 2018. Uh, um, yeah, so you can just see like a uh, you can have a look yourself at the article in the article, but you can just see most of the growth is really coming from the growth in the manager state. Um, so the manager state started just a a little bit back in 2009, which is as far back as this goes. Um, so the just to give you the starting figures, so the, the brewery business was doing 91.8 million pounds of revenue in 2009, and the tenanted estate was doing 26 million pounds in revenue in 2009 and the managers uh, inns were doing 124 million so still higher but you see we then move up to 2018 the year that it was the um, the beer business was sold the brewery was sold and it's gone from 91.8 to 152.9 but then the you look at the so that's you know probably like a 50 60 percent maybe a little bit more increase then you look at the over the same period what the managed ins done and they've gone from 124 to 272.2 so it's um yeah more than doubled in the same time so faster growth there and the tenanted ins haven't really done a great deal from they've kind of they've gone from 26 to 30.2 so a modest increase so um, operating income shows a similar trend to revenue and remained positive in all of the last 20 years including financial year 2021 where it turned steeply negative operating margin remained pretty consistent over this period averaging 13.3 percent in the 19 years before the pandemic though with a notable decrease in financial year 2019 and financial year 2020 after the sale of the beer business and I've said it's hard to pinpoint the cause of this exactly but um, and then expand we look at the margins a bit more closely and um, so I've done like some I've shown some graphs here of the operating income and then the operating margins um, and then I've done a segmental split of the operating income and I've said here that looking at the, the, the segmental split of operating income we can see that the beer business had significantly lower operating margins so between four and six percent than the managed pubs and hotels business which was greater than twelve percent um, and the tenanted business which is greater than forty percent so obviously you don't have to 
pay for all the expenses of the staff and so on. That's all carried by the tenants. Um, so yeah, the, the key point there was just that the brewery, the beer business, had significantly lower operating margins. So losing that is well, it's not like it had higher margins and they sold it, and now it's brought the margins down. So that you can't say that was the cause. Clearly, I think it'll probably be some. Uh, maybe some inventory movement or something like that because suddenly the goods are being sold to the company effectively rather than it being a kind of internal movement within it from one subsidiary to another or whatever um, that's one area one re segment of the business to another uh, so it's probably some just accounting changes and things that would have washed out but didn't have a chance because it then hit we then hit covid um, and the pandemic lockdowns which had just clouded everything so the company's net income has been a little more lumpy than the operating income but has still had has still been positive in all of the last 20 years except financial year 2021 there was an anomalous spike in financial year 2020 due to the proceeds from the sale of the beer business so yeah you can see probably I mean, I'd use net income here, but it might have been better to use. Um, I think they had a like an adjusted net income figure as well. It just sort of took out this rather crazy spike. So you can see, kind of in 2018, we had 35.8 million pounds of net income, and then after the sale, it was 19.3 million pounds, and then suddenly, in the year the sale proceeds were recognised. It just shoots up to 160.9 million. So yeah, but yeah. Anyway, the point is, it's it was going all the way back to 2002. The net profit was positive in all the years, um, even through the the Great Recession of 2008 and 9. Um, there is a little dip there, which is on the revenue and operating income. You can't really see anything, but there was a little. It may be unrelated, but um, that was sort of 2009. But yeah, profitable in all those years. So an, an upcoming recession for anything anything that isn't actually going to have government mandated closures, which we had in the pandemic. Anything short of that should be easily handleable by the company, and probably won't really have a big impact on it. So looking at the semi-annual revenue figures, we can see that revenues in H1 2023 have normally returned to pre-pandemic levels. However, this does not account for the substantial inflation that has occurred over has occurred between then and now. On a real basis, sales are still a little down on a positive trend, but on a positive trend towards recovery. So yeah, you just see here on this graph, just looking at the total revenues on a half yearly semi-annual basis rather than the annual figures and it's sort of a smooth few figures across and you get the a drop and then we're back up to kind of the level we we're at in 2019 I guess yep yeah. but um, yeah in the first half of 20 of the what would be the 2020 around year wouldn't it um, but yeah actually up until the 20th of September 2019 those six months we're around about the same level now up to the 24th of September 2022 which is the last reported period but yeah inflation will have had an impact on that but yeah you can see a nice smooth upward trend towards recovery there so one final thing I want to mention while addressing the income statement is inventory turnover which you can see increased substantially after the sale of the beer business due to the consequent reduction in inventory held on the balance sheet, with a slight lag effect due to inventory turnover using the average inventory. So yeah, we you don't see the effect. What I'm trying to show here is that uh, the inventory level drops, it's going along and it drops from sort of 13.5 million pounds down to just five between financial year 2018 and financial year 2019 and then it's down to four in 
launch year 2020 and then kind of sitting around 3.6 million now I think that was roughly what we it might have come up a change a little bit from that in the figure I mentioned earlier but um but yeah it's below 5 million now let's say um and previously it was sort of above 10 million so it's it's more than halved but then and then you see a consequent change in the inventory turnover as a result um so there's a bit of a lag effect because as I was saying with the the average inventory being used for the inventory turnover so um you see a jump from so the inventory turnover in 2018 was 18.2 million pounds and then it jumped up to 30.34 million pounds and in 2019 because it was still using kind of the average between the 5 million and 13.5 million and then but then in the first year that it was you know cleaner with the lower figures which was 2020 where it was 65.38 million so a massive jump up um yeah and that's uh, why it, the figures are now um I mean, they were looking like a supermarket before anyway. That's what I was going to say. Now looking like a supermarket, but it's pretty much the same kind of. It was a fairly high turnover before anyway, but now substantially higher because it's, the inventory is not being recognised as sort of held on their books because it's been held previously. It was being held in the wholesale beer business. Now that's been sold off, so now they just receive. They only keep what's actually in the pubs, effectively. Right. So let's move on to have a look at the cash flows. Just gonna have a quick sip before I do. Like the income figures, cash flow from operations (OCF) has been positive in all of the last twenty years, except financial year twenty twenty one. Free cash flow (FCF) has had a few negative years due to capex being somewhat lumpy at times. I've got a graph showing what I just said there. So a fairly nice, smooth op operations, operating cash flow is increasing, following a very similar sort of curve, and then similar kind of picture, but a bit more lumpy for the free cash flows because some um, years they'll have had a big investment in the brewery or something like that. Um, as things are depreciated down and then had to be replaced or so on. So. Um, Free cash flow is perhaps not the cleanest metric here since the split between maintenance capex and enhancement capex is roughly 50% in most years. Uh, so this is going to be in the managed and tenanted inns business rather than the brewery when I'm, when I'm saying this. Um, but the brewery is no longer in the picture so that's uh, not needed to be included. Here. So, so um, yeah, that since the split between maintenance capex and enhancement capex is roughly 50% 50 in most years. Factoring this in, you'd expect the gap between operating cash flows and free cash flows to halve. To put this into hard numbers, management has outlined a policy of spending in the region of 20 to 30 million pounds on capex investment, which would equate to 10 to 15 million pounds on both maintenance and enhancement capex. In financial year 2022, they spent 26 million pounds and in the in H1 2023, they spent a further £12 million, so very much in line with their, with their policy there. So just to clarify what constitutes enhancement capex, examples could include capacity expansion, e.g. increasing the number of rooms in a hotel or the number of tables in a restaurant, and efficiency improvements. Both of these examples would improve the, prof the profitability of a pub slash hotel and so extend beyond simple maintenance. So prior to the pandemic, so I just other example could be maybe like improving the efficiency of a of the ovens in a kitchen or something, or the heating system in the hotel, or something like that. That's going to that would be something an example of efficiency improvements. So uh, prior to the pandemic, the company had a progressive dividend policy extending back seven decades, with a target dividend cover of two point five to three times. Making, uh, sorry, equating to a payout of 33 to 40% of profits. The compound annual growth rate, CAGR, 
for the 18 years prior to the pandemic was 6.41%, and the historical average yield since 2006 has been circa 2%. Um, see graphs below. So you can see the a nice, very smooth curve with a little spike and chopper that just otherwise very smooth uh, curve in the growing dividends and that went sort of all through the last recession and so on and then it just drops off in 2021 because of the obviously the closures and sort of come back in 2022 it's now actually back up to sort of I think they did 7 million last year but the figure but in 2020 was about 11 million so that's kind of where I'd estimate they're going to bring it back to when things get back to full steam again. Um, and then you can see another graph here of dividend yield and um, yeah that's pretty much oscillating around the sort of 2% mark over, since sort of before financial crisis. Um, right, so in financial year 2022, a total dividend of £7 million was paid to ordinary shareholders, equating to 11.31 pence per share, split between a 7.41 pence final dividend and a 3.9 pence interim dividend. The company also engages in share repurchases that are largely to nullify the dilutive effect of share based compensation. In H2 2023, 1 million A shares were repurchased for this purpose. So that was sort of after the period end, they announced that that had been done. And you can see in the filings um, to the uh, stock exchange that we could, we could see that data. Um, so yeah, on the subject of share repurchases, I mean, that was something when I initially saw the massive discount to book value, I thought, oh, this is a, it's like a natural opportunity for for some share, you know, to increase the earnings per share effectively by by doing that um, instead of paying dividends on they could be doing share buybacks and and what have you but um, it's not quite as clear cut I think since I sort of looked at that I mean with the ownership structure and so on you'd end up just by doing that you'd end up giving the internal shareholders which obviously they can't really buy back their shares um, unless they I don't think the, the company sort of um, constitution allows that so uh, yeah they'd end up they'd be buying them off the public market at that discount and also the internal shareholders because they're not probably this is not going to sell them at, at such a discount are they they'd be buying them back at the book value so there wouldn't be any of that benefit um but anyway so yeah buying them back the public shares would just end up reducing the voting rights of the public even further so i'm not entirely sure whether that's exactly favorable um and, and, and there's probably explains why they haven't done something like that um, but I think yeah, it was mentioned as something they, they've they got in their arsenal potentially uh, but anyway they've got uh, they, a lot of the focus seems to have been on I mean we'll get on to the conversation later but a lot of their conversation is based on earnings per share metrics anyway so um, if it makes a lot of sense earnings per share, on an earnings per share basis to buy back the shares then management is incentivized to do that so um, yeah it's definitely in their interest to do it if it if it does make sense um, yeah speaking of management let's uh, let's have a look at the management so the chief executive Simon Emony has been with Fuller's for more than 25 years he was appointed to the board as retail director in May 1998 subsequently becoming managing director of Fuller's Inns in July 2006, followed by Group Managing Director in November 2010, and then Chief Executive in July 2013. He has also held a number of non-executive directorships, including Senior Independent Director at Dunelm Group PLC and W.H. Smith PLC. Chairman Michael Turner is, an, is a chartered accountant and joined Fuller's in 1978, initially as Wine Director before being appointed marketing director in 1988, managing director in 1992, chief executive in 2002, and chairman in 2007. As you can probably guess from his surname, Michael is also a member of one of the founding families, the Turner family. Neil Smith appointed finance director in 
November 2021 to replace Adam Council, was previously Chief Financial Officer of Domino's Pizza Group, PLC, and before that CFO of EI Group, PLC, which is short for Enterprise Inns. And this was the the UK's largest pub company before it was acquired by Stonegate Pub Group in March 2020. So he's also a chartered accountant. It's an interesting story, I actually looked into that a little bit. Um, so they had something like 5,000 pubs. And the reason they had to be, they were acquired was A, they didn't have the, the and it was an interesting case study between what it, what a, a pub group that operates very much on a high debt lease model, which is maybe the most profitable model, but not the most financially stable. Um, versus the freehold model where you yeah your your return on equity equity is going to be quite a bit lower because you've got all these massive freehold assets behind there rather than selling them out and using and using debt instead and leasing out the properties um but the thing is if you hit some kind of crisis like we like we had with the pandemic where everything's closed and they're not able to the operation they're not able to operate they don't have any of that freehold they need those freehold assets to back them up. They don't have the ability to borrow beyond what they're already doing. So they've not got anything to secure the the lending against. So they got into a, a real pickle there, and they were then bought out um, by the Stonegate Pub Company, which is, I believe, now after the acquisition, the UK's largest private pub group, and they have over over five thousand now um, pubs, but. I mean, obviously, another factor is the the ownership structure. The fact that the uh, the, F- the F- Fullers is family controlled, so it's going to kind of prevent these. I'm not sure exactly how the the deal went with this um, Enterprise Inns Group, but um, presumably they it was uh, done on the public markets here because I, th- I don't think there was any family uh, component to family o- ownership of the business. Oh, and certainly not a majority. Anyway, moving on. So Fred Turner, another family member, is a chartered accountant, so lots of chartered accountants here, and currently serves as retail director. There are a number of non-executive directors who represent... Sorry, there are two non-executive directors who represent the Fuller family, namely Sir James Fuller and Richard Fuller, along with three independent non-executive directors, Juliet Stacey, Helen Jones and Robin Rowland OBE, all have considerable experience in areas relevant to the company and the final board member is Rachel Spencer the company secretary in November 2022 the company added a new member to its executive team which was Sam Bork Sam is joining the company as marketing director a role she has previously held at both Wasabi and the restaurant group which is the owner of a number of restaurant chains including Wagamama, Frankie and Benny's and Chiquito. Because the business is still family controlled, it doesn't comply with several principles of the UK Corporate Governance Code, specifically the requirement that at least half the board, excluding the chairman, are independent non-executive directors, the requirement that directors are subject to annual re-election, and the limitation that the chairman be in post for no more than nine years. The chairman has been in post since 2007, as we said, and the I think they re- the directors are re-elected on a biannual basis, so every other year. Um, right, so executive compensation. The executive compensation consists principally of a base salary, a performance-dependent bonus, and a share-based long-term incentive plan, LTIP. The LTIP shares have a nil vesting price, meaning they're grants rather than purchase options. The base salaries of the chief, exec- of the chief executive, financial, finance director, and retail director from 1st of June 2022 were £525,300, £363,000, and £210,000, respectively. This was after a 3% increase in line with the wider workforce. The maximum bonus is 100% of base salary, of which 80% is determined by group adjusted profit before tax, and 20% on individual business objectives. 
This was 70-30 in financial year 2022. In financial year 2022, the total bonus payout was 61% of base salary. And uh, bonuses earned above 75% will normally d be deferred into shares for three years. For the financial year 2022 LTIP, the chief executive and retail director were granted awards of 125% of base salary and the finance director was granted an award of 100% of base salary. These awards will vest based on pre-tax adjusted earnings per share performance for financial year 2022 with a threshold of 44.89 pence per share and a maximum of 54.68 pence per share. So 25% of the awards vest for threshold levels of performance. So it's going to be, if they get the threshold of 44.89 pence, then they'll just get 25% of the available uh, share award. And if they get the maximum, then they'll get 100% or 125% of their base salary um, in this case. So yeah so those figures are quite important those are sort of like the that's the target range they're looking for for financial year 2024 so which would put the current share price uh yeah somewhere in the middle of that range would be or well, towards the upper end of it would be about 10 times on a earnings per share basis there so there was an additional recovery ltip award granted with a maximum opportunity of 250 percent of base salary this was to incentivize management to stay with the company and help it recover from the impact of the pandemic lockdowns. The award will vest based on adjusted EBITDA targets for financial year 2024 with a threshold of £55 million and a maximum of £73 million. Uh, those are the, the, re the ranges for adjusted EBITDA, not their, not their awards. Um, while an adjusted e EBITDA target is not as aligned with shareholder returns as earnings per share, it does seem appropriate for an award focused on business recovery. The financial year 2023 LTIP awards will be granted at the same percentage levels as the financial year 2022 awards, 125 and 100% respectively, uh, 125 for the CEO and retail director, uh, presumably because they're, they have more of an influence on the earnings of the company than the than the finance director uh, I'm guessing and the the uh, finance director yeah is getting the 100% versus 125% uh, and will vest based on adjusted e earnings per share performance for financial year 2025 so we've got another th threshold and maximum so the threshold for this um, financial year 2023 LTIP is uh, so the threshold they have to meet in 2025 is 49.93 pence per share and the maximum is 60.15 pence per share so yeah quite a bit higher and uh progressively higher than above the financial year 2024 targets so the ltip awards granted in 2019 were based on group adjusted earnings per share performance for 2022, but the threshold was not met and so the awards elapsed. Executives are required to hold shares worth at least 200% of their salary based on the share price on 26th of March 2022 of £6.20. Simon Emony, Fred Turner and Neil Smith, the CEO, financial director and retail director respectively, held shares with a value of 281%, 448% and 10% of salary respectively. So obviously the Neil Smith only joined recently so he hasn't had the chance to build up his salary to the required 200% yet but I think pretty much all of his share based compensation has to be uh, held and can't be sold until it crosses the 200% of salary threshold. Since being appointed Chief Executive in July 2013, Simon Emony has had a good record of achieving his performance targets with annual bonus and LTIP awards averaging greater than 50% of the maximum available, excluding the years affected by the pandemic. 
By this historical precedent, we can probably expect the future earnings per share and adjusted EBITDA to be within the target ranges specified. So yeah, that's uh, my expectation would be that they would be somewhere within those threshold to target range, as that's what he's historically been able to been able to do. So a quick sip and then we'll move on to the valuation. As the company sorry, as a company with very significant tangible assets, there are a number of ways to go about valuing fullers, but let's start with book value. Comparing the last reported book value of four hundred and fifty seven point one million pounds or seven pounds forty one per share to the current market capitalization of seven, of three hundred and twelve million pounds with share price of five pound and fourteen pence. The price to book value P to B of is zero point six eight. This presents a significant discount which becomes wider if you incorporate the more recent real estate valuation that raises book value to eight hundred and thirty eight million pounds or thirteen point eight eight pounds per share making the price to book 0 0.37 so just over a, a third with the 1999 estate valuation Fuller's has historically traded for around one and a half times book value as can be seen from the chart below so I've got a chart here of the price to book value and you can see it's traded for most of the last or well, since 2006 the average across that whole period has been about one and a half times book and it was actually higher before the financial crisis so it's not like it's just been a post financial crisis phenomenon um, so excluding the recent revaluation the historical precedent would suggest the company is currently trading at half its historical price TF is one and a half and it's now trading at sort of uh, 0.68 and you've got sort of 100% uh, upside there potentially to get it up to sort of about the one and a half times mark if it, that it traded that historically um, but obviously I mean it did come down a little bit still above one but it did come out a little bit after the brewery sale in 2018 or 2019 so there is potentially some kind of impact from that um, but then again things have been crowd, uh, clouded from 2020 onwards so hard to know exactly whether that was just a temporary blip um, right let's have a look so tangential to book value is total is TV to EBITDA total, en total enterprise value to EBITDA since this is effectively the metric used when calculating the value of the company's estate you can see from the chart below the Fullers has historically traded around the same multiples used in the estate valuation, 10 to 12 times. Given the bit the target set out set for financial year 2024 of 55 to 73 million pounds, we can derive an, S an enterprise value of 550 to 730 million pounds with a 10x multiple and 660 to 876 with a 12x multiple. The current stock, uh, sorry, the stock currently has a total enterprise value of approximately 520 million pounds, including lease liabilities, which sits below the lower bound of this range. So yeah, the total sort of range there, including the multiples and the the, the potential range for the actual EBITDA. You know, would take you from 550 million to 876 million so we're sitting below the, the, the bottom of that range um, and quite a way below the, the top so next we can look at the net earnings the historical P multiple for Fuller's has been somewhere around 15 times equating to a 6.7 percent earnings yield with the targeted earnings per share for financial year 2025, which has the sort of the, the furthest out ones we've been given, of 
49.93 pence to 60.15 pence, a 15x multiple would imply a share price of £7.49 to £9.02 and two pence in less than two years' time. So, yeah, I mean, take this with a bit of a pinch of salt because we don't know whether um, with interest rates rising again and so on. And I know this includes a period before before 2008 as well, uh, where interest rates are a bit were still higher. But um, and I know this is kind of you know really because of the property behind it. But um, which you know, I'll get onto that a bit. But yeah it might not trade on such on such a low earnings yield well whether it's it's not massively low but it might trade on a on a higher earnings yield going forward if interest rates remain high um the, the base rates so yeah it might not quite get in it, that range might not be exactly realistic if we were basing it purely on that it's more likely to be the underlying assets that keep the value up but yeah, we'll get on to that. So um, this historical earnings yield chimes with the dividend yield we so we looked at earlier, which has been around about 2%, with 2.5 to 3 times cover. So yeah, 2.5 sort of to 3 times takes you up to around about the 6 to the 7, well, 5.5, it would be, yeah, in this case it would be that kind of range there. Um, sort of five to six percent, but it's six point seven percent. Yeah, so roughly about same kind of levels we saw there on for the dividend yield. So with the dividend paid last year of seven million pounds, the current yield is two point two percent, and if it returns to the twenty nineteen level of eleven million pounds, the yield would be three and a half percent. If the yield were to revert to historical levels, you'd be looking at a market cap of five hundred and fifty million pounds equated to a share price of nine pounds and six pence. So remember that's the market cap, not the enterprise value that we were looking at earlier. Um, so yeah, that's uh, again another one to take with a bit of a pinch of salt because we don't know whether uh, the yield on sort of fixed assets, effectively like this, is going to going to go up in terms of the uh, the expectation, the market expectation for them when you compare them to sort of government bonds which are trading higher than that. Um, yeah, so the historical earnings dividend yield is lower than many other UK listed companies, but can in part be explained by the freehold real estate Fuller's has on its balance sheet that de-risks the investment to a large degree. There's also the fact that the company has been able to sustainably grow its earnings and in turn its dividend by greater than 6% annually, with plenty of scope to continue doing so into the future. So yes, yeah, Quite a bit. Um, there's plenty of plenty of room for the company to grow. So, I mean, you look at we mentioned pub chains that had five thousand pubs. Fuller's is only in the high three hundreds, and it's only really in the in the south of England. And yes, I know it's operating in the premium segment, and it's largely wanted to be based in around London and the south of Eng across the south of England because that's the the more affluent areas, but there are plenty of affluent areas up in the north. I can uh, I can tell you I live in New York, which is house prices here are, are pretty high. You've got sort of Cambridge, it's in, down in, in the East Anglia. That's quite a a wealthy area. Um, definitely scope for them to. I mean, house prices there are comparable. To some areas in London, you've got um, yeah. I mean, they've got other cities they could expand out to. Bristol. Bath, both very still in the south of England, but I don't think they've got much of a presence there, if anything at all. And they're very, they'd be very lucrative areas, very wealthy people in affluent areas in those. And uh, yeah, and um, I mean some of the up, cities up in the north as well. I mean, on towns like Harrogate, uh, Knaresborough, places like that, are going to get quite a few affluent clients that would be able to afford to go out for dinner in a Fuller's pub, for instance. And I mean, and when you were talking about affluent areas, I mean, those two, uh, well, one of those Michelin star restaurants is, I believe, based over near, is on the coast, over sort of Liverpool, Manchester way. So, you know, if people are still able to go there to a three Michelin star restaurant, I think it was, that was the Fat Duck, possibly, the name of that one. 
Um, people can still afford to go there. Up north, it's, there must be some fairly well-off people around. Uh, but anyway, so um, yeah, and the again mentioning with the growth sort of side of things, if the company is able to grow, this is a reason why it potentially would trade on a lower yield than um, what you could get, sort of the risk-free rate perhaps or stuff like that, is because you've got a substantial element of growth here which you don't have with government bonds. There's no there's no growth element to those. You just get back your coupon at the end. Or you get you collect your coupons and you get back your principal at the end. So um yeah, one final thing I'll mention is that if you'd bought the stock at its lows at the start of 2009 and held it to the end of 2015, you'd have had a CAGA of 20% on the share price alone. Assuming dividends were reinvested, you'd have quadrupled your initial investment over those seven years. Looking at the price chart, we could be at another historic low. So, some food for thought there. Um, yeah, we're kind of, if you adjust for the growth in the company's portfolio and inflation and stuff like that, um, the share price is pretty much down where it was back then, slightly slightly higher, like I say, because of those factors. But yeah, we could be in for another upward climb, potentially. So um, with a sort of multiple re-rating and just general underlying growth of the of the dividend uh, of of the business as well. Um so yeah, I think it's a, a very compelling pick. I like I said mentioned earlier I've got a put up a, a substantial position in my own portfolio um with it. I think it's the downside is well protected by the real estate. I think it's very resilient to recessions. Uh, with it because it's a premium offering and you've seen that evidenced through the all the revenue and operating income and so on data um, and it's been profitable all the way through the last 19, 19 years before the pandemic so yeah I'd, I don't really see I mean the only the only risk I can really majorly see is that um, is to do with the having to roll over the debt every four years or whatever but um they seem to have been able to do that fairly sustainably for the company's history and I think obviously if worse came to worst and they they might be forced to sell some pubs to cover it or whatever or they just or seed some pubs to the to the uh, debt uh, holders debt syndicate their lending syndicate um, to to compensate for that but the point is that even you take away that you've still got a substantial upside in terms of book value owned to shareholders so I don't think you'd be losing any shareholders you know I don't think you'd be losing any shareholders equity there you're still going to be your head's going to be well above the water there so it's um, yeah very compelling I'm personally invested in it and uh, yeah kind of it ticks all the boxes for me it's, it's uh and it's kind of uh quite different to some of the other companies i've done i mean the fact that you've got these really tangible assets it's very much a net asset play really um i think it's the fundamental thing but with the bonus of having a really strong operating business that's very resilient um and sort of fairly recession proof so and and there's plenty of sort of underlying business growth potential so yeah it's um yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. But yeah, you can check out the full article on uh, firmreturns.com. Um, I'll, I'll put it in the in the notes for this episode as well. But yeah, you can check it out there. And, and uh, I've also posted a link on Twitter. If you want to have a look at there, I'm just at firmreturns. All very simple and easy. Uh, but yeah, all right, I'll, uh, I'll call it a day there. And uh, see you next time. Thanks for listening.